Lord, you are a king uh, that is unable to be approached by the individuals that you created. And yet, Lord, you are the one who has provided the way for us to come to you. Lord, it doesn't come through external law keeping. It does not come through uh, outward religious rites that somehow merit such things. No, it only comes by the means you have marked out, which is your son. Death on a cross for others. The law being satisfied entirely through him and so faith in him frees us from that bondage and we are able to be with you forever. God, I praise you for the time that you have given us tonight to thank you for your word and I pray you would just give us a sweet time reflecting on the grace that is in the gospel and how you use Paul as a means to care for the Galatians when that message was threatened. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, good evening. We are now at the 48th book out of 66 books uh, going through the Bible in a series. And uh, last week, I think it was Scott Demaris working through 2 Corinthians, which is great. And uh, I have a much easier task than the men before me because I only have six chapters to work through rather than many more than those. Uh, the book of Galatians, which we're probably familiar with, was written probably sometime around A.D. 50, in between A.D. 50 and A.D. 53. And sometime after, Paul and Barnabas had finished up their first missionary journey. So in Acts chapter 13 and 14, you can follow Paul and Barnabas outside of our time tonight, because we don't have time for it, as they make their way into the region of Galatia with the gospel. They traveled through the cities of Pisidian Antioch, Lyconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and then Timothy actually is from this region as well. Uh, the believers among the churches in Galatia, they were rather diverse. Uh, something is good for us to know that is Paul's custom. He always preached forgiveness of sin in faith in Christ in the synagogues first. It was always to the Jews first. And then he would make his way out uh, to where he was speaking with individuals that were Gentiles. Also among the grouping during the time that he was making his way through Galatia, you would have converts to Judaism. So proselytes is that big word. Converts is the easy one, right? These are the Greeks that actually came to Judaism. Uh, they were individuals that were also found in the synagogues. Paul and Barnabas also faced tremendous persecution, primarily through the unbelieving Jews while they were in this region. Often the persecution came directly at the hands of the Jews, and then at other times they stirred up other individuals that brought persecution directly to them. Paul was actually stoned during their first missionary journey towards the back end of his time, dragged out of the city assuming that he was dead because he was preaching this message of forgiveness in Christ. These believers in Galatia, they loved Paul. And he and Barnabas had demonstrated what it was to suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. They had a godly example of what that looked like. After they appointed elders over the churches in this region during that first missionary journey, they returned from that journey back to Antioch from where they were sent out. And just listen to this. You don't need to turn there if you don't want. This is Acts 14, starting at verse 27. It says this, When they had arrived at Antioch, they gathered the church together, and they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the, gen with the disciples. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren this message. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So this is the teaching that made its way into the region of Galatia, into the churches that Paul and Barnabas had planted. And so he writes this letter to combat this false teaching. Now I want you to consider just how dangerous it would be to embrace that teaching. It would mean that sin cannot be forgiven through faith alone in Christ alone. It would also mean that Christ came to save sinners and then he immediately placed them under bondage to obey the law. Also think about how this would be for individuals in Galatia. They didn't have the book of Galatians. Galatians. 
they didn't have any of the gospel accounts. They didn't have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. And then they had the teaching of the apostles and whatever else they scribbled on whatever they had around because manuscripts weren't something that everybody had access to. They couldn't reference something like this. So false teaching makes its way in and it's compelling. They're using the Old Testament. This seems like it's something that is legitimate, but it's different than what Paul taught us. What did they need? Direction. They needed strong words from the one that loved them. Another thing to consider really is just the force of this letter. We haven't read it yet or started, but Paul is a loving spiritual father over the Galatians, writes with an amplified force that equals the danger this teaching of acceptance within the church represented. The issue is terrifying. And so you look at his language and you're like, whoa, like this is, this is an issue. And as a parent, you do that, right? Kids are playing outside. Here's the road, big vehicles on the road. Kid runs that direction. You're not like, hey, might not be a good idea to run out into the road. No parent does that. You yell. You're not angry. It's your kids. But that danger requires an elevation in your voice. It requires it. And so we shouldn't be shocked when we read Galatians and we see Paul using strong words, strong force, because the danger is so weighty. He's also hopeful of their right response in this letter. In chapter 5, verse 10, he says this. He says, I have confidence in you, in the Lord. You will adopt no other view. He also closes the letter by addressing them as brothers. A final thought before we read the opening section, we lay out the main points of the letter. Just work to place yourself in the complexity of the Galatian churches. Just think about this. As I said earlier, there were Jews and there were Greek converts to Judaism. They were in the churches. They had come to Christ. There were also Gentiles, so former idol worshipers who had never stepped a toe in a synagogue. They're unfamiliar with the law, which everybody else would have regularly heard from and even followed. Those with a background in Judaism were almost certainly to be circumcised. Jews, absolutely. Converts to Judaism, absolutely. Because of the fact that they were Jews and they had converted to Judaism prior to faith in Christ. But by contrast, there's Gentiles among these churches and they're, they're not circumcised. So just think through the factions occurring in the midst of these churches during the time that Paul is writing. Some Jews are being won over to the false teaching. They would be inclined to not associate with the unclean Gentiles. There would have been a resulting self-righteousness they would have been tempted towards in that. And the Gentiles, by contrast, feeling the separation from those who they previously spent time with, they would have been inclined to do what? To accept circumcision so that that difficulty was removed. It's just a church that would have been so difficult to operate in. Regardless of where you were, it would just would have been tense. It would have been a hard place to go and just open God's word and be encouraged. And so these outward ritualistic man-made practices, they had to be stopped in terms of the way that they were being observed. What did they believe about circumcision? What did they believe about the law? That is the issue. If Christ died to free them, Jew and Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, and he saved them from their sin, that means they were all one in Christ, sons of God. And so Paul has to step into this. How do you do this? And thankfully, Paul wrote it for us. And so let's start in Galatians. I'm going to start in verse 1, we'll read through 10, and then we'll start working through the structure of the book. It says this, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through man, but through Christ Jesus and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Which is really not another, 
Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a slave of Christ. And so the issue is presented. Tonight we'll make our way through Galatians looking at two primary headings. It's hard to summarize a book, but these are the two that I summarized it under. One, there are four things that he wants the Galatians to know. There's four things they need to know. If he's going to combat the issue that's happening amongst the Galatian churches, it wasn't that it was actions necessarily first. They needed to know. These are all verbs in the indicative on the majority. Truths they remembered and then forgot. Or truths that he had to give to them yet again. And so there are four things that he gives them. He wants them to know these things. And then there are three things he calls them to do. And that comes on the back end of the book, chapter 5 through chapter 6. And so let's start first with the things that he wanted them to know first. The first one is this. It's divine origins. The gospel that he preached had divine origins. Look down at verse, I think, 11 of chapter 1. It says, For I make known to you, brothers, that the gospel which I am proclaiming as good news is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul says here that his gospel message, which he preached, was not given to him according to human teaching methodologies. He didn't sit down and read a book. He didn't sit in a lecture. He didn't listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube video to get up to speed on what the gospel was. It didn't come by regular methodologies that we think through when it comes to schooling. In fact, he says the message that he preached, it came by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. He says this occurred right after being saved by the Lord in Damascus. Uh, look down at verse 16. Talking about God being pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might proclaim him as good news among the Gentiles. I, Paul, did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. So Paul, after he was saved on the way to Damascus, he didn't stay there long, but he departed for Arabia and he received the gospel from the Lord himself. What's interesting is that in the account in Acts, Luke does not draw emphasis to this three-year period. He shows him in Damascus, there's ministry in Damascus, he leaves and he goes to Jerusalem. But Paul gives more clarity here. Luke left that out because it wasn't the focus of the book of Acts. Paul places it here in Galatians. A three-year period of time. Now, I don't know how long he was in Damascus, how long he was with the Lord directly while he's teaching him, but that was the duration of time. It wasn't Paul's message. That's the point. It wasn't his message that he preached to the Galatians. The next thing that falls underneath this with the gospel message is the confirmation by the apostles. We see this in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also along. And I went up because of a revelation. I laid out to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private so that uh, those who were of reputation... Um, I missed that. I laid it out to them, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, lest somehow I might be running or had run in vain. So it has been 17 years now since he was converted on the road to Damascus. And this is the first time he sits down to confirm his gospel message with the apostles who walked with the Lord before him. 14 years. And so here's the question. Does it pass orthodoxy? Are the apostles going to give their stamp of approval? Look down at verse 7. It 
It says, but on the contrary, seeing that I have been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he who worked in Peter unto his apostleship to the circumcised worked in me also unto the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. This is alignment. Paul shows the Galatians that the gospel of faith and Christ alone to save from sin was not only what he received directly from the Lord, it actually is confirmed by the apostles themselves as well. The message they first heard and believed was true. Nothing was missing. Nothing needed to be added to it. Next, we see that Paul's message is, is sufficient enough in its defense even against error. This is shocking in verse 11. It says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to coming of certain men from James, he, that's Peter, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to shrink back and separate himself, fearing the party of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before everyone, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Peter and even Barnabas became susceptible to the fear of man and a desire to please certain men, probably claiming to come from James, by separating themselves from the Gentile believers in Antioch. This even occurred after Paul visited them in Jerusalem, right hand of fellowship, then down to Antioch, separation. So Paul doesn't change. His solution doesn't change. Paul does not shrink back. In God's grace, he does not shrink back in fear. The solution is still the same. Look at verse 16, chapter 2 says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So Paul's defense, it remains the same. While Peter and even Barnabas were tempted to separate themselves, outward observation of law-keeping to separate from the Gentiles, Paul immediately confronted it for what it was. It was a demonstration of denial that salvation comes through faith in Christ, not through works of the law. It's one thing to say outwardly, we're saved by grace. It's only through faith in Christ. But then you're not willing to sit with your Gentile believer because uh, he's unclean. The outward action actually denied and betrayed the statement that was made. That's what Paul confronts. That's what he confronts. Verse 20 is a text that we absolutely love. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. They needed to know the gospel. Was the gospel accurate? Paul reminds them it was. It's a divine gospel. They got it from the Lord himself. The apostles confirmed it, and it's sufficient to fight against even this heresy making its way into the church. The second thing he wanted them to remember was this. Faith alone brings righteousness. This moves us to chapter 3. Come down to verse 2, and we'll read 2 and 3. It says this. This is the only thing I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You can almost hear the sarcasm in that statement, right? It's a rhetorical question. Um, You began by the Spirit, right? But now you're being perfected by the flesh? This is a wake-up. He brings them back to what they originally believed when he made his way into Galatia made his way around these churches, proclaimed the gospel. They believed through faith in Christ. They did not believe through works of the law. 
He then introduces Abraham as an Old Testament reminder that prior to the law being given, he declared righteousness by faith in the promise that was made to him. Look at Galatians 3.6. It says, even so, or in the same way, just so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, salvation does not come through works of the law. It comes through faith alone in Christ alone. And guess what? Abraham is a picture of that in the Old Testament, going back to the book of Genesis. In verse 9, he summarizes the implication of the promise that was given to God by Abraham. He says this, all of the nations will be blessed in you. Those who believe in the gospel now, they're among the blessed, just as God promised to Abraham, the believer. And by contrast, in verse 10, Paul reminds them that the law keeping or law keeping cannot justify a sinner because it demands perfection, which no one's able to, able to attain. Look at verse 10. It says, For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. So rather than being declared righteous and that coming through faith, it's impossible. Trying to maintain obedience to the law cannot happen. Verse 11 says, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. Why? For the righteous shall live by faith. The disposition of the righteous is that their confidence is actually in the Lord to save them. It is by faith. Christ had to fulfill the law on behalf of every believing Galatian that existed. It's the same for us today. Look at verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Circumcision and law keeping were powerless to produce the righteousness that was needed to take away sin. And so because the consequence for those who know the law and do it perfectly, even though they believe they are being perfected, Scripture clearly says, if you do not keep all of it, you actually are underneath a curse. The blessing of Abraham is not on your side. You are in a position that is cursed. It's a horrible position to be in. And it leads us to the third thing the Galatians needed to know, which is to think rightly in the midst of this glowing or growing false teaching. And this is the third thing they needed to know. It was this, the law does not conflict with the promise. Look at, look at verse 15. How does a believer, more importantly, how do the Galatians need to think about the law? The law, is a, it's a reality. It's there. The Old Testament obviously has the law. But how do we think about the law as it makes its way over into faith in Christ. What do we do with Christ? And what do we do with the Old Testament law? And Paul wants to answer that question for them. He starts by looking at the timing of the promise given to Abraham specifically. Now let's look at verse 15 and we'll read to 17. He says, Brothers, I speak in human terms. Even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified or put into place, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. And what I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified or put in place by God. And so he begins this with the reality that the promise that was given to Abraham it wasn't superseded by the law when it came. In the same way that we're all thankful that the Noahic covenant that was given to Noah with a rainbow in the sky, that God's not going to flood the earth in the same way he did previously, none of us assume that that's been done away with because the Abrahamic covenant came, the law came, uh, none of us are looking out our windows waiting if we see storm clouds. We're terrified. Why? That law still stands. The covenant is there. And so what he's saying is it isn't that the law hangs large over the Abrahamic covenant, meaning the shadow of the law is cast over the Abrahamic covenant. No, the blessing that came through Abraham's covenant is large. And the law has a place that kind of fits underneath the shadow of that. 
The promises made to Abraham didn't do away with the Noahic covenant, just like we said. And the giving of the law does not do away with the covenant that was given to Abraham. It doesn't. Or rather, the law was given in order to do a particular task, to increase trespasses and to hold everyone accountable to God. Look at this in verse 19. It says, why the law then? Why did it come? Here is, here is the question. Why did the law come? It was added because of trespasses. Having been ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Come down to verse 23. It says, but before faith came, we were held in custody under the law, being shut up for the coming faith to be revealed. So the law was given principally as a tool to show everyone's trespasses with greater precision. The impossibility of being righteous through trying to obey it is something we've already looked at. All are held accountable to it in even greater accountability coming to the law and coming into contact with it. But there's something significant in verse 19 and in 23. Did you guys hear it? The word until, the word before. Look back at 19. Now in 19, it, there's a phrase in here that says, having been ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator. I'm going to skip over that just for a minute. It says this, why the law then? It was added because of trespasses until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. It has a duration of time. It has an expiration date in the life of a believer. Look down at verse 23. It says, but before faith came, we were held in custody under the law, being shut up for the coming faith to be revealed. That means prior to faith, we were in custody under the law, being shut up under it. After faith, a change occurred. The law's purpose of sealing up everyone under sin at some point does. It changes for a believer. Paul uses terminology specific for that. A believer's relationship to the law changes when they place their faith in Christ because Christ has actually fulfilled it. Paul illustrates this with a picture of a tutor. We see this in verse 24 and 25. Look at 24. It says, Therefore the law has become our tutor unto Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Now, I just want to think about this. When, when I think about a tutor, I think of a gentle relationship with a person, and this person's helping me, and I probably should have met with a lot of these people in high school and in other periods of my life, so I could be coached along in these things, but that's not the picture of the tutor here. This is a very different relationship. Um, MacArthur did a great job of just bringing clarity to this. A tutor is a slave that was employed by Greek or Roman families whose duty was to supervise young boys in behalf of their parents. So they took their young charges to and from school, made sure they studied their lessons, and trained them in obedience. They were strict disciplinarians, scolding and whipping as they felt it necessary. That's the tutor. That's the tutor. Does that sound like just an enjoyable relationship? Like, this is my tutor. Here he is. It's great. I'm going to go back to the house and get whipped. Constant supervision, strict training for obedience, scoldings and whippings when you get out of line. This is the weighing down of the law on the individual prior to repentance and faith in Christ. This is what this is. The guilt over sin, the weariness of sin, the impossibility of perfection, that is the tutor. That's what it's doing. That's its job. Now, the tutor only had authority over the master's son until they reached the age of an adult. And from that point on, the tutor had no authority over the son. He was free to carry about on his own. The picture is perfect. We can easily grasp it. Spiritually, for a believer, the law only has authority over them prior to faith in Christ. That's it. That's it. The implication of all being under sin, under a tutor, now being free, means all are what? They're equal in Christ. All forgiven. No one has a greater righteousness than another because everyone who has placed their faith in Christ has received the same righteousness. Righteousness. 
the same. Verse 28 expresses this. He says this equality among the Galatian believers, it's there regardless of their background, their status, their ethnic background. Jew, Gentile, Greek convert previously to Judaism. They have all been forgiven. They have been declared righteous through faith in Christ. Now, if that is true, and it is objectively, then factions and divisions must not be present across ethnic lines in the churches. They can't be. If we say this is true, then it affects the way that we live. It affects the way that we live. This moves into the fourth thing he wanted them to know. You are all sons of God. This starts in chapter 4, verse 1. Paul carries the same picture of sonship into chapter 4. He again picks up some of the same terminology as he did in chapter 3. Let's read in verse 3 of chapter 4. It says, So also we, while we were children, were enslaved under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Verse 3 has the same focus on time. While we were children, indicating our duration of years prior to faith in Christ. We were under bondage or shut up under sin. Uh, here he also talks about something called the elemental things of the world. And in the present context, the, the law actually is the thing that can be passed over into the elemental things that you were under. Could also just be thinking about Gentiles that are in the church in Galatia. Practices that were ritualistic. Things that you do to clean up your life, to make things better. They're the ABCs, the one, two, threes, the simple things of this life. They have no power to change you. No power to save you. Look at verse 9 in chapter 11. Verse 9 in chapter 4. That's where we're going. But now, having known God, or rather, having been known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you want to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you for nothing. The Galatians here are shown as observing even Jewish Sabbath festivals, etc. Things that we would find in the Old Testament law that were prescribed for the Jews. He goes on to say in verse 12 that, he is no different than them, saved by grace apart from the law. He says, become like me. Become like me. Verse 13 to 16 are the appeals of a father in the faith to his children. He warns them, warns them, warns them, appeals to them. He's pleading with them here to remember their love for Paul in the beginning, asking that they would not give ear to the false teachers with ill intentions. He desires to win them back to what is true. This section closes up with an allegorical picture of spiritual sons of the promise of Abraham. You have uh, this idea of Sarah and Hagar. Now, if we think of Sarah and Hagar in the Old Testament, right? Sarah is the one that had the child of promise, Isaac. Hagar is the one that had the child by the flesh. Uh, Sarah and Abraham trying to come up with a way to bring about the promise, right? Ishmael is the result of those things. But here he flips the whole thing on its head. You have believers that are Gentiles. You have believers that have come to Judaism, but they're not Jews, and then they've been saved out of that. And you have Jews. Some of them can trace their lineage back to Abraham. He is our father. But the Gentiles could never do that. They can't. But they're sons, and so he gives this picture, which is great. He flips it on its head. And he says, for Jews that have not come to Christ, that represents Jerusalem. They are bound in their sin under the law, in slavery. They actually are more like, as a picture, like Hagar, in slavery. And then he says, those who are in Christ, regardless of their genealogical record, Gentile, Jew, guess what? You are sons and daughters of the promise. That is the picture that he gives with this allegory. 
There was so much that they needed to know and perhaps being reminded of already things that he would have come to when he was there with them. But having reminded them of all of these things, he now calls them to do three things. In the same way that a father doesn't just say, hey, be aware of these things and moving on. No, he directs them. You must do this. He loves them too much to just give information without actually directing them and what they need to do. The first one he does is this. He says, stand with confidence in what they know is true. We see this in verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, stand firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He then warns them that they embrace circumcision as a means of righteousness. They are cut off from the saving work of Christ. Because they would be saying that Christ did not fulfill the law on their behalf through faith in him. And so they had to outwardly live in a way that was true. This is a true reality. Stand on this. He just gave them a whole list of things that are true realities. He says, stand on these things. But something we have to remember in this, look at verse 11. We have to remember something about this. This isn't a throwaway command to stand on what is true. They know what is true. Paul says this from his own experience. Look at this. He says, but I, brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross would have been abolished. What is the thing that it will cost the Galatians to stand firm? It will cost them persecution. They will face tremendous opposition. Not only the false teacher that presently is there with them, which is now growing and you have more there, but Paul faced tremendous persecution when he was in the Galatian region, even being stoned. But he stands and tells them to stand firm. This is true. This is right. You have to stand in these things. To stand with Paul and embrace the gospel of faith alone is to take on the opposition of the false teachers and the false teaching. So the question remains, if you're wiggling in your seat about everything that Paul communicated about the law and that it's no longer having its rule and its sway over a believer, if you're like, oh my goodness, there's going to be just, everybody's running crazy with unrighteousness. How do we regulate individuals living in a way that's holy? And lots of false teachers said that about Paul. And he has a solution that God has given. Verse 13 says this, says, you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not turn your freedom, that's freedom from the law, do not turn that into an opportunity for your flesh. He says, that does not mean you pursue unrighteousness. Far from it. Far from it. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. We get a picture here of what's happening within the Galatian churches. In the midst of the false teaching and the controversy, what was the external fruit of the false teaching? We need to follow the law, pursue circumcision, biting and devouring. This does not sound pleasant at all, does it? Biting and devouring, factions, divisions. That's what the law produces, that that's what your focus is externals, everything you can see, but not dealing with heart-level issues. God's solution comes in verse 16. How does a believer live? How does a believer walk in a way that pleases the Lord? This is the, the big word sanctification. How are we sanctified by Christ? Our sin has been done away with. It's been dealt with with Christ on the cross. Now, how do we live? How do we walk? Verse 16 says this. Paul says, in contrast, rather than the biting and devouring, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Believer, how are you sanctified? How are you changed? What does Paul say? 
says what the solution is here, it's a temptation for us merely to look at external things we can do to make our life easier, to clean something up. Perhaps somebody points out an area of sin in your life and your solution is, well, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. I'm going to go pick this up at the store and get it, from my, get it to my wife. That's going to make her happy, etc. Those do not last. They do not have power to change you. Verse 16 is clear. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. In fact, there's a construction in Greek here called ume. So I'm gonna, there's going to be a test afterward. You're all going to have to answer that. Ume is it's negation. It's saying no on this. And when he says those two, he's saying right now, understand there's never going to be a time where a person walking in the Spirit is also manifesting the works of the flesh. It'll never happen, ever. And... It'll never happen as a possibility in the future. You can bank on it. A person who is walking by the Spirit will not be able to carry out the desire of flesh. That construction is so tight, it's, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible. The solution to Paul's warning in verse 13 to not turn their freedom into an opportunity for flesh is this. It's walking which is living their life in humble dependence on the Spirit of God to not carry out the desires of the flesh. That's biblical sanctification. Paul gives a command here to walk. That verb carries the idea of living life. It's active. You are active in this process of dependence on the Spirit to change you. Rather than the idea of just praying that God would change you and then you do nothing about it. I'm passive in this process. That is not how God describes biblical sanctification. He just doesn't. This is a believer actively living their spiritual life in humble dependence on the Spirit of God to change them. And so Paul reminds the Galatians they do not have the power apart from this dependence on God's Spirit to put the deeds of the flesh to death. It starts a, a living vibrant relationship with Christ himself. Do you find yourself in a regular, vibrant relationship with the one who saved you? Is Christ your everything to change you? When there's an area in your life where you're seeing works of the flesh popping up, do you call out to him for his help to change you? Are you renewing your mind on his word so that you're thinking with clarity, so that you start walking in step with the Spirit? Does that define you? Look down at verse 17. It says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you will not do the things that you want. Believer, if you have the spirit of God living in you, there is a war that's regularly occurring. You're fighting you haven't, nothing's happened outwardly yet. Guess what? You're fighting desires, intentions. This is the same word for lusts, things you're wanting. It's temptation to sin, and it's, no, that's sin. And God, I'm in reliance upon you to change me. Give me a heart that desires to pursue what is right. That is the war that occurs in the life of a believer. That's good. If you don't see that war occurring in your heart, that is something that you should be concerned over. When the war is waging, it means you are fighting. It means you're fighting. No one can ever claim that their outbursts of anger came from actively walking by the Spirit. Uh, here I am, and I'm just walking in the Spirit, and I've had all of these fleshly manifestations. It doesn't work. I want us to look at the list. Let's look at verse 19. He says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ uh, Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in step with the Spirit. The person who's carrying out the desires of their flesh will stick out like a sore thumb. You will see it in your heart. Verse 19 to 21, they categorize the outward manifestations of a fleshly driven life. Paul says in verse 21 that the one who makes a regular practice of these things, not one off and you're fighting, the regular practicer of these things should not have confidence that they are saved. What I mean by that is the individual who only sees a life driven by the flesh with outward manifestations of those things. And they don't see the fruit of the Spirit anywhere in their life. Look at your life. Be suspect of those things, he says. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit seen in verse 22 through 23 are the outworking of a believer who is walking in this humble dependence upon the Spirit of God to change them. Verse 24 through 25, they state that the believer who has the Spirit of God living in them is actually able to walk by the Spirit. You have what you need to do this, believer. The Galatians had the Spirit of God living in them to walk in this. Because your flesh was crucified with Christ at the cross, you were made righteous, justified through faith in Christ. With the result, you can actually walk in a way that pleases the Lord. You are not in bondage. That's what he's saying here. Believer, what do you see in your life? What do you see in your life? Rest assured, there will never be a time when you're perfectly walking by the Spirit. Never. Uh, That is called being glorified in heaven. But when you see the outworking of your fleshly desires in your life, do you call out to God in humble dependence? You call out in humble dependence upon His Spirit to change you? Do you run to external methods of change? Reliance upon the Lord, renewing your mind on what is true, keeping in step with the Spirit in light of those things, that is where change is. We're coming to the end in chapter 6, and just notice that this freedom from the law that results in being able to walk by the Spirit to put the deeds of the flesh to death, does not just work to sanctify an individual believer. It enables believers to care for other believers. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Bear one another's burdens. That is the last thing he calls them to do. In verses 1 through 5, believers are commanded to gently restore a sinning believer who is caught or trapped in any transgression. This is the individual who's been carrying out the desires of their flesh has found themselves trapped in their sin. I mean, just think about you walking in the forest and stepping on a bear trap and that thing comes and latches onto your leg, right? Just the idea of it makes you cringe a little bit, right? It requires a person to come in a particular manner, gently, right? Not quick. Hey, we're going to get this thing ripped off real fast. We're going to get you out of here. You're you're gentle. You're figuring out how do I get the person out of the trap? This is the person that comes with gentleness to the person who's in sin. And it requires an individual who's walking by means of the Spirit already to be able to walk with another in those same things. Verse 7 through 10, God lays out the principle that you will reap what you sow to. And it is here where a believer kind of just conceptually has two fields. If you are constantly reaping to the flesh, guess what? God is not mocked. You will reap flesh. You're going to see that outworking of fleshly desires in your life. That's just, that's just how it works. And if you're regularly sowing to the Spirit, you are walking in humble dependence on the Spirit, guess what you'll see? You'll see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. God is not mocked in that sense, meaning a person cannot raise their hand and say, I've been walking in humble dependence upon the Spirit, but their life has the fruit of the flesh everywhere. God says, no, pursue walking in humble dependence on the Spirit. 
In the same way, the individual who is walking in the flesh cannot expect to see the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Paul closes the letter just reminding them in verse 11 through 18 that the gospel saves from sin. Not circumcision, not uncircumcision, not law-keeping, nor anything else. It is the gospel alone. That's it. What was the solution for the Galatians? It was everything they needed to remember. It was their freedom that Christ had purchased. And what did they need to do? They had to walk in humble dependence upon the Spirit of God to change them. Let's close with prayer and wrap up. Heavenly Father, God, I praise you for your Christ. A precious king, a loving friend, one who bore the burden that I actually had. He bore the burden for everyone who is here. He bore the burden for the Galatian believers that we have never met. And someday, Lord, we will. Lord, you have not just given us a gospel that saved us from our sin. You have given us the gospel and your spirit which sanctifies us from within. God, I pray that you would give us a heart that desires to be humbly dependent upon you. Make us those who are reliant upon you. Lord, that we would be in a close, living, vibrant relationship with the one who saved us and redeemed us. And I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.